Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. I almost wish I can just video call my insurance company during my most severe attacks and say, do you want to prescribe the medication now? I think that would be a great time. Welcome to Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. Hi, I'm Joe Co, Director of Education Digital Strategy at the Global Healthy Living Foundation and a migraine patient for over 20 years. Today, I'm joined by Candace Camper, a wonderful advocate who teaches people about the beauties of having a service dog to help navigate life with migraine. Her service dog, Clea, helps her with tasks to support her during migraine attacks, such as deep pressure therapy and grabbing water and medications for her. I'm delighted to have you on the show, Candace. Can you tell me a little bit about your migraine journey? Sure. So my name is Candace. I had headaches since before I could even remember, but I'll definitely say by age 12, that's when I started telling my parents, like, Hey, my head's hurting. My head's always hurting. My dad could relate. Um, he would say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, just lay down. But then my, these headaches, what I thought were headaches, were getting worse, more powerful, making me feel dizzy. You know, I couldn't stand up straight. The light was hurting my eyes just so much more severely than these headaches that I had always known. I th- kind of thought I was the odd one out in my family. Everybody had headaches and I had these headaches that made me throw up. And, you know, I just I had these bad headaches. And so I, I never actually have been to a headache specialist. I, I will say I've only been to neurologists over the years. Um, besides, you know, in recent weeks, I've signed up with a headache specialist, but I've tried different medications for them to kind of treat them. And initially, before I started doing preventative injections, I couldn't find really any relief. My attacks were still severe. You know, they were still severe. Now, I will say, you know, some days I would have, you know, a headache that wasn't as severe. Every day was kind of different. No day was really the same, but my attacks, as intense as they got, they were always the same vomiting and like sensitivity and things like that. When I initially got a service dog, I had I did not have migraine in mind at all. It was all about, okay, how can this dog help me with seizures? How can this dog help me with this and that? And then after she graduated and came home with me, I realized a lot of the tasks that she were doing could help me during migraine as well. I'm like, okay, I can't bend right now. Like, or the light is killing me. Can you please do this? Can you go do this? Can you do that? And I'm like, wow, wait a second. <laughs> this is actually working. <laughs> this is actually That's helping. That's amazing. Me. <laughs> There's a couple of things, Candace, that you said that, Super interesting. One, many of us don't see headache specialists. I haven't seen a headache specialist. Right. Um, and I do this work. I have a podcast about talking head pain and I haven't seen a headache specialist. There's so few in this country that many of us are going to be treated by neurologists and primary care physicians. Uh, super interesting, your connection to epilepsy and migraine and your experience being treated for both diseases by the same type of doctor, but my experience has been that some neurologists specialize in epilepsy, some in headache and migraine. And my brother developed epilepsy a couple of years ago, later in life. And we've had these parallel experiences with neurologists. We see very different ones. So that must be interesting, managing both conditions. Do you see one neurologist for both? Yeah. So at one point I did go to an actual epilepsy specialist, but when I moved to Indiana, there was like, here's a neurologist that within this many miles, you know, <laughs> that's able to treat, you know, multiple conditions. And even now I have a epileptologist and working on getting a new neurologist and stuff as well. But for a long time, my neurologist was treating both. Uh, something I like to ask all of our guests on Talking Head Pain, and you may have shared some of this. What is your worst migraine attack like? Can you walk us through what it felt like? What went through your head? So I will say... My worst migraine attack, among among many, this, I always say this is my worst because I was in the hospital already. I was already inpatient, which you would think probably is the best place to have a migraine attack, but it was not at all. One, because they stripped my medicine away from me to begin with. So the medicine that I was used to that worked for me, I didn't have accessible to me. And because I was there for another reason, when I'm complaining of, oh, I have a migraine and if I'm talking to somebody who not, who does not have that experience or is not able to understand exactly what that looks like for me. And they prescribed an over-the-counter treatment. So I remember sitting here, already under stress from the reason I'm already in the hospital. You know, I'm starting to get head pain. I can feel like, oh, this is not going to be good. I'm getting nauseous. And I explained to the nurse, okay, I have a migraine. Like, this is not, this is getting worse. This is not, I can feel it uh, going up here, if that makes sense. And so typically my migraines, my pain's always on the left side, on the left side of my head. And so I remember explaining to them, like, you know, I'm getting a migraine. And she said, okay, I'm going to call the doctor and let him know. And when she came back, she said, here, I have some medicine for your migraine. And it wasn't over-the-counter medication. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> this is not going to help. <laughs> Similar to my experience with insurance companies, it's almost like they wanted me to try 
try a few medicines here and there before they would actually give me something to help. But one of the reasons why that was my worst migraine is because it felt like I was suffering very intensely for a very long time, if that makes sense. And I wasn't able to treat it how I would, you know. Originally with the ice packet or the counter medication, that wasn't the most helpful for the gravity of pain I was experiencing. And then when I began to vomit, and I'm vomiting uncontrollably, obviously they brought me Zofran, but they're also like, are you feeling sick? Maybe you have the flu. Maybe you have other conditions that that weren't related to migraine. And I'm explaining to them, no, this is migraine. I know it looks a little different, but this is still my head. This is because of the head pain that I'm experiencing. Yeah, it's unfortunate that, you know, what you're talking about, Candace, is called step therapy. And it's a process that insurers get in the way of our prescribers saying that you have to try and fail something first before you can get the prescribed treatment. I deal with it all the time. I just uh, last week had to spend a week redocumenting the medications that I was on with my insurance company who already had documentation of the medications that I was on. I was like, you have this information. Why are you making my neurologist do this again? And I mean, I know the answer. They're making my neurologist do this again because it saves them money by denying the medication that helps us live better lives. So it's really frustrating. I'm sorry that you experienced that. How are you feeling now? Like, are you in a good treatment routine? You have your service dog. Can you talk a little bit about where you are today? Yeah, so as far as today, I still want to say I'm not exactly where I want to be, especially going through transitioning and I have new insurance now. So I'm going through that same process now where I'm explaining, I've taken this medicine, I've taken that medicine, you know, this is why I deserve this medicine that I need now. And so, but I will say in comparison to where I've been in the past, having my service dog, having new treatments available to me that, I, that I'm that i very hopeful about. I will say I am better and I still have a little while to go. And when they told you, when your neurologist prescribed you an injection, were you hesitant to take it? And if you were, how did you get over that? When my neurologist first prescribed an injection at the time, I said, whatever it is, give it to me. <laughs> I'm willing to try it. And that was years ago when I tried multiple injections, multiple different kinds. So the reason why I was most hesitant, if anything, was because I would be injected in myself. But besides that, I was more than willing to try anything that could help me. Since you've been on the prevention medication that you've been administering yourself, have you felt like it's impacted you in, in a good way? Yes, it has. It has. The medicine that I have been taking has been really helpful. I have had a brief pause in the medication, as I mentioned previously, only because of insurance. So I should be able to be right back on track soon here. But compared to the other medicine that I was taking and compared to just taking pills, this actual preventable injectable medicine, I like uh, more than the other. So I think it is really helpful. So that pause, I think it's important to talk about because I didn't realize that your insurance was pausing a treatment that you were like, for lack of a word, stable on and doing well. How has that been emotionally and physically? Are you getting more migraine attacks? Are you feeling pressure or anxiety. What is that like to have that pause when you've had something that works and now you have to fight with insurance? What does that feel like? It's very stressful. And I was already anxious about it because I knew I knew this time would come and I thought I was preparing for it. I thought I would be ready. And now the time is here. And, it, and throughout the suffering, it's just really, it's frustrating. It causes anxiety and it's stressful, especially when you're working with a new provider and new insurance. You know, you're getting stabilized with this new provider, and then you have to explain all your past treatments to this new insurance, and it almost feels like you have to explain yourself to get the stuff that will help. And so I almost wish I can just video call my insurance company during my most severe attacks and say, do you want to prescribe the medication now? I think that would be a great time. <laughs> and so it is frustrating. Yeah, I, that's a really interesting idea. Like, let's send video messages to our insurance companies when we're in pain. Patients being delayed their treatment is unfortunately a shared experience for many. I asked Dr. McAllister about the consequences of insurance companies delaying someone's treatment. The optimal use of my time with a patient is that I try to really listen loudly and customize a care plan for him or her. And we decide together on the right medicines. And when they're working, it's fantastic. Many of them feel they have their life back to some extent and they're functional and they're working. So, you know, it's a shock sometimes when an insurance changes or they lose insurance or they change jobs and you have the patient is told you can no longer get that amazing medicine. Uh, they have choices. One is to try to go to the one recommended by the insurer. Um, because we have a somewhat broken healthcare system that is usually a, an older, inexpensive drug uh, because they're 
trying to save money. Uh, sometimes patients have to go through that and fail that to demonstrate the need for the drug that was taken away from them. The, the bottom line is these non-medical switches are just not right. They're not good for patient care. Um, it's driven by the insurers and it's a problem. In my center, um, I often write letters to insurers. I try to yell loudly at them and advocate for my patient. Um, sometimes telling the story that the patient missed you know, seven work days in a month until the medicine we decided to put them on and then they missed no work per month. I mean, sometimes these things do resonate, um, but often they don't. So we try to find something then on the formula that's as close to what they were on uh, and, and, and give that a go. I've had similar conversations with them. And it's sad because the people that are denying us, they also get denied and they're not the ones that are making money off of the denials, but you know, the shareholders are. And it's a system that isn't made to make us feel good in the in the quickest way. And it's it's really sad. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your service dog and your Instagram account. Can you talk about this relationship that you have with Leah? <laughs> yeah, so Clea is a golden retriever. She's cream color. A lot of people say, is that a lab? I'm, or they say, I've never seen a gold in that color. I'm like, yeah, she's a golden retriever. And I got her from a company in Indiana. I was initially matched with a different dog that was career changed and ended up being a therapy dog. And so they told me like, the original dog we had placed you with and we plan on placing you with is not going to work out, but don't worry. We have another dog, a golden retriever. We think you'll love her. And I'm like, oh, okay. I hope so. <laughs> and so... I've had her for a few years now and she has a, she's trained to do a lot of different tasks that help me. And even one task that after I got her, I didn't realize how much it was help, would help. And when I went back and said, can you help me train this task? Because I think this will really help with migraine. And they said, okay, yeah, we'll help you train it. And that was forward moments of pulling. So some of the tasks that she's trying to do is forward moments of pulling, item retrieval. She can get a drink from the refrigerator. She can get, bring medicine. She can help with balance assistance. I have a vagal nerve stimulator. And so how she helps with that is she will snuggle against my chest with um, my magnet for my stimulator on her collar. And so I initially started documenting those things only because people had told me, oh, that's so interesting. I never knew a service doctor would do these things, or I never knew you can get a service doctor for these different conditions. And I, I was just interested just show it, just showing people, you know, how she can help and that if you need the help, service dogs can be trained to help you. Amazing. I encourage everyone to go to Candace and Clea on Instagram to see this beautiful relationship and important work that Clea is doing. I mean, really is, you said, you talked about the dog having career change. This is a legitimate function that these animals provide for folks. And it's, it's so important and special. Why did you feel it was important to share on that Instagram page, your chronic disease journey, being a BIPOC person, having a service dog, what has been some of the things that you've experienced by being so open about this part of you? Yeah, so before I got a service dog, I ran into a lot of misinformation about them. So before I had the right information, I had all the wrong information. And I didn't know who to go to besides Google. And a lot of times when you Google things, there are ads that pop up that you shouldn't really click on because they don't have the, the correct information. <laughs> And so another thing I had never seen outside of maybe a movie or two was a black person with a service dog. And a lot of people in my family and my friends group, when I told them I'm getting a service dog, they're like, really? Like you can do that or really? Like they were just really surprised because in the black community, I haven't really seen many people or my friends have not really seen many black people with service dogs. It was different, you know, it was different. And a lot of people ask me, are you sure you want to do this? Like, <laughs> and I'm like, I need to do this. Like I need to do this. And so one reason why I wanted to document it is because I felt representation is important. Like maybe I can be the person with the right information, with this color skin that can tell the next person who needs a service doc who is thinking about it. Like, it's okay to do it. Like if, if it's gonna help you, if it's gonna change your life, go ahead for it. And so I felt that representation was very important. And it's helped me because even in public, around in public, I've had people come to me and say, hey, I have a family member who needs a service dog, or I have a family member, even with guide dogs, people have said, oh, I have somebody who needs a guide dog. You know, how, what do I do? Or how do I, you know, ask me questions and things like that. And so I've always felt like, oh, I'm glad that I can be the one to give you this information because I will steer you the right way. And so that has made me very proud. And like I said, Clea has changed my life in more ways than I can even imagine because originally I hadn't even, I didn't even know that she would be able to help me with migraine because I'm suffering so often. I couldn't even imagine what I would do without her. And so 
especially as I mentioned before with forward momentum pulling. That's something that I had learned about kind of through the service dog community. I didn't really, really know much about that or what it was or how it could help, but that is one of the tasks that I use most often. Amazing. And do you find that there are other people that have service dogs that have migraine that are using them in, in a similar way? I have. I have met people online through Instagram and TikTok who have mentioned, oh yes, you know, I have a service dog that assists me with migraine or even if it's not, maybe they have another condition as well, but they also have migraine and they're like, oh, maybe I, my dog can do this task as well to help me with migraine. I think it's really opening people's eyes like, okay, you know, because obviously there's still a big stigma around migraine and the perception, even the perception I grew up with is still out there where people just perceive migraine to be, oh, just a simple headache. And so with the true understanding of what migraine is, what it means for me and what it can mean for other people and what a service dog can mean as far as helping those people, I think it kind of opens people's eyes like, oh, wow, a dog can actually do this for me. Like migraine is a disabling disease and this service dog could be tasked, trained to help me with this disease. And so I think it's really eye-opening. My last question, we talked a lot about how you have found the right treatments for you. What would you say to folks that haven't found the right treatment or are experiencing some of the access issues that you are navigating right now? What did it mean to you to find the right treatment? And what do you tell people that haven't? and um and or are struggling to access it yeah so um barriers to treatment are always very difficult i think i have to agree it is a very hard thing to experience but one thing i would recommend is don't lose hope don't stop fighting for yourself you're gonna have to fight for yourself and that's okay another thing that i would mention is as far as somebody who's you know found treatment that works for me over a long time of experimenting i'm very happy i'm very grateful and i don't take that lightly but if you haven't found the right treatment yet be vocal with your doctor, have a relationship, communicate, because they need that documentation of how it's working for you. And if you aren't explaining to them or telling to them if it's working or if it's not working, and if you're not open and honest, you won't be able to get to that next step that insurance is taking us through. And so I recommend being very open and honest about how it's making you feel. Maybe keep a journal, keep a, um, you know, they have tracking apps and things like that. So I recommend tracking it and really having a good understanding of what you're going through to the point where you're able to explain it to somebody else. Three hundred percent. Yeah, this was a really wonderful discussion. So glad that you joined. I learned a lot about service dogs. I didn't realize how they could be utilized by people with migraine. It never occurred to me until following your your amazing work. And I know that with a chronic disease or diseases, it's energy to do these types of interviews. So I appreciate that you were able to expend some of that with me. So thank you. Of course, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm always willing to kind of share what I've been going through about Clea, because like I said, a lot of people don't know. And I just think using my platform, using my voice to just at least tell people, you know, what I can, I appreciate, I appreciate that opportunity. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. If you like this episode, please give it an honest five-star rating and subscribe so you never miss another one. I'm Joe Co, and I will see you next time. This season of Talking Head Pain was made possible with support from Amgen, a sponsor of the Global Healthy Living Foundation. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.